And now your host for the Prophecy Club, Stan Johnson. Welcome to the Prophecy Club. Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we provide information and resources for the prophetic warning message to win souls. And I'm delighted to introduce our speaker this morning because this is the primary message that God has called me and the Prophecy Club to get out. That is a warning message to America that if they don't stop sinning and turn to Jesus with their whole heart, God will bring judgment on this nation. I'm trying to stop that with everything I can possibly do. And uh, I'm going to try to keep this brief, but I actually began to meet Michael Boldea for the first time back in uh, about March of 1988. I wrote a letter to Demetri Dudeman, asked him to come to speak one evening for the Full Gospel Businessman. He wrote back and said he'd come for two weeks. And I thought, two weeks? What am I going to do with this guy for two weeks? So he showed up, and by the time he showed up, God had supernaturally filled his calendar. We went to seven different radio stations, six different Christian meetings, and a television station, all in two weeks. Demetri later said that was the busiest two weeks of his life. And we had him speaking every night, sometimes two or three times a day in different places. So he's very busy. And uh, essentially his message is this. He's a Romanian pastor that smuggled Bibles into Romanian Russia for over 30 years. He was finally arrested, put through five months of torture, culminating in them putting him on the electric chair twice. Not once, but twice. When he's on the electric chair, the same angel that had been coming to him, telling him how to get the Bibles through, came to him once again and said, Dimitri, you're not going to die. You're going to America to give them a warning from God. Sure enough, he told him the year, month, day, and hour he would be exiled, and precisely 10 o'clock, July 22, 1984, he was exiled to America. He came to America. The angel came to him once again and said, get beside me. And he took and showed him all of California and Las Vegas, New York and Florida. And he said, you see what I've shown you? All of this is Sodom and Gomorrah. And one day it will burn. He said, it's sin has reached the Holy One, and God has decided to punish this nation with fire. Now, let me just say, God also told Jonah that Nineveh was going to burn, that Nineveh was going to be destroyed in 40 days. Well, it was destroyed, but it was 40 years later. In other words, we know that we can delay, at least delay, those prophecies. And I would like to delay what was pronounced upon this nation. Daniel went on to say, the problems in America will start with an internal revolution. In America, started by the communists, some of the people will start fighting against the government. The government will be busy with internal problems. Then from the oceans, Russia, Cuba, Nicaragua, Central America, Mexico, and two other countries will attack. They will bombard the nuclear missiles in America, and America will burn. Now, there's many more things in the story, many more things in the testimony, which, of course, is available in a videotape. And I'm also in the process of writing a book that puts all of the details all together. We had Michael in about two years ago, and he made this videotape called A Call to Holiness. This videotape is, is really speaking my heart because it is really telling America what she must do. We all have to clean up our lives and turn back to Jesus. Now, with that, let me tell you about your speaker. I met him when Dimitri first came to... As a matter of fact, it was the Topeka area, and he was Dimitri's interpreter. He's his grandson. He interpreted for Dimitri for some 10 years, and uh, 
He's been a licensed ordained minister for some 14 years. He travels literally across America speaking, and he also runs an orphanage back in. Most today is this. Why would I care what would happen after I'm gone? No, not, not after I'm dead, after I'm gone. Because the modern day teaching is that we're all going to sprout wings and fly away. And then all these things shall come. Why would I care? Honestly, I wouldn't. The only thing that concerns me is that I make it to heaven. Everything that happens to earth, on earth afterwards, none of my business, none of my concern. I'm in heaven with God. All is well with my soul. Now, if we're not supposed to be here for these things, and we're not concerned what will happen to earth after we're gone, why does the Bible speak of them? There's only one answer that makes sense. See, God, God is a God of sense. He gave us reason. He gave us logic. These are things that we can use. Because God is not an illogical being. God, God is very logical. He, he reasons things out. And he says, look, I'm telling you these things that are going to happen because you're going to have to go through them. Whatever generation it happens to fall upon, it will be the greatest generation of the church. But it will also be the greatest trial of the church. See, oftentimes we look at trials and tribulations as, as horrible things. Read the word. They're great. You're supposed to have joy in your tribulation because every trial and every scar that you hold is one victory that you had in God. Every trial that you go through makes you a stronger believer and makes you a stronger Christian. Later on today, we're going to be talking about the, the sprouting of the wings. Because a lot of Christians are living in that age and that time where they're saying, Lord, my bags are packed. Where's the bus? And the bus isn't coming. And they're growing more and more concerned because they believe in their hearts that they're never going to have to see a day of darkness and a day of trial. We're the special generation. We're the special nation among the world that will never see trials. We're supposed to go away. Why are these things happening? We're not supposed to be here. And we still are. You read the word of God with spiritual insight and you realize every verse makes sense the last. Even that part about the great falling away. The only way that could happen is if majority of believers on this earth believe that they wouldn't be here for when it came. Because if I purpose in my heart that I'm not going to go through a trial, that I'm not going to suffer something, and I see the suffering with my very eyes, I will bend and I will break. This is why th this teaching and this doctrine is so harmful to the house of God. This is why it's, it's the breath of death itself. Because it teaches you that you're never going to see suffering. And when you see it, you're going to run. Because that's not what I signed up for. Pastor told me I was going to be rich and die rich. What's with this suffering? What's with these trials? It's what the Word said you'd go through. But that's not what Pastor taught us. Friends, it's in the book. It's going to happen tonight. We're going to go to Matthew 24, and we're going to get some insight on what the future holds, not only for this nation, but, but for the church and for the world. Because if we believe judgment and trials are coming only to America, we have a limited view. These are the end times that we're living in, and God is still looking for servants to work while it's still day. The night is coming, and it's coming quickly, and it's coming quicker than any of us thought. And so many Christians that I speak to, oh, persecution could never come to America, because there's, you know, they'd have to jail 75% of Christians. If you believe that 75% of the people in this country, faced with a gun to their temple, would not deny God, then you're living in a dream world. There will be no outcry. There will be no human aid. There will be no international controversy because the number of those willing to stand up for God will be so little that the world won't even blink.
time is short. Go with me to Luke, because some, some people have a problem with the scripture. It's scripture. I, I can't change it because you don't like it. I can't say it's not in there because it is. Luke chapter 13. And this is the reason for the urgency. This is why so many preachers are out there seven days a week talking about Christ because we can hear the door on the hinges. It's creaking. The master is standing. He walks to the door and he's beginning to shut it. And those with discernment and those with spiritual insight are beginning to hear the closing door and they're beginning to see that time is so short that every second is precious. Verse 22 of Luke 13. And he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. And we talked about this earlier. That was the nature of Jesus. Nobody saw him as odd because he went and he taught. Because that's what Jesus did. That's, that's all that Jesus did. He taught because it was his nature and it was his passion. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able Amen? Amen? Now, in the Greek translation, the word strive is agonize. Agonize. It's not something that you do easily and readily. Because when you want to walk through the narrow gate, it means you have to leave all excess baggage behind. Think about it. Jesus said to him, agonize to walk through the narrow gate. Because many will want to walk through and they won't be able to. They'll be unwilling to leave behind the burdens of the world. They'll be unwilling to leave behind the temptations of the world. And they'll struggle to get through, but they won't be able to. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence. Wow. These, these weren't people ignorant of God. These weren't people that, that didn't know anything about Christ. We ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. Translation. We enjoyed superficial Christianity. We liked it when it was easy. We ate and we drank and we had a good time. And Pastor taught we needed three homes and five boats and, and, and millions of dollars in the account. We ate and we drank in your presence. You taught in our streets. But you never entered the temple. You were in the street, but you never entered the temple. See, superficial Christianity will only take you so far. And it's just this side of being inside. Superficial Christianity cannot take you into the house. And when the master stands up to shut the door, you'll be on the outside looking in. It's as simple as that. I can't change it. If I were to come and preach to you that, that this verse doesn't exist in the Word of God, then I will be condemned. And I will have blood on my hands. And that's not what I want. Grace is not eternal. It's here for a limited time. And the Master will stand up to shut the door very soon. And all those that enjoyed superficial Christianity without walking through, without leaving the world behind... will weep and mourn because they had the opportunity. And it continues and it says, but he will say, I tell you, I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves 
thrust out. They will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God, knowing the word of God is only half of what you're supposed to do. You must not only know the word of God, but live the word of God. That's what God asks of his children. See, God shows no mercy. God shows no mercy on these men who says, Look, we knew you. We were best buds. We, we talked and we ate together and we had some fun times. If you knew me so well, you should have known that the door would be shut. If you knew me so well, you should have known that inside was the only place to be. Be forewarned, Russia's back. And this was a dream that my grandfather had in April of 1997, right before his passing. And it was a dream about the bear waking up again. And back then, none of this stuff was, was even viable. Russia was supposed to be bankrupt. People were eating their own children. All of this gross stuff was coming out about Russia. Right now, fastest growing economy in Eastern Europe. Russia's back, baby. This is seven years later. See, before I read it, see, I'm no good at reading stuff. Before I read it, I gotta, I gotta say something. When God speaks a message, oftentimes it's a little earlier than when it's on on CNN. I hope you understand my meaning. Because a lot of people have this expectation of prophecy coming to pass the next day. Look, some people can guess real good when they see certain events happening. I heard uh, an old prosperity preacher that just came out with, Oh, Lord told me America's in trouble. No kidding. <laughs> really? But these things were visible to the naked eye already. When God speaks, he speaks so long in advance that no one can deny it was God. Prophecies of Christ's birth span from 300 to 600 years before his birth. You realize a little bit of God's time frame, and then you grow a little more patient than you once were. God speaks in advance so that no man can say it wasn't God. This dream that he had was, again, in April of 1997, and it's titled here, The Bear Awakes. And he says, I knelt beside my bed to pray as I do every night, and he did, before I go to sleep. After finishing my prayer, I opened my eyes, but I was no longer in my room. Instead, I found myself in a forest. I looked around, and to my right, I saw a man dressed in white who pointed his finger and said, See and remember. It took me a while to find out what he was pointing at. It was a small bear who seemed half dead, lying on the ground. Sort of the picture of Russia back in 97. As I continued to watch this bear, it began to breathe deeper. With every passing minute, it seemed to revive itself. And as I watched, it also became angrier. It then began to grow. Soon it was larger than the forest floor. And as it grew larger, it continued to become angrier. It then began to paw the ground so that when its paws would hit the ground, the earth would shudder. The bear continued to devastate all that stood in its path until it became, it came upon some men with sticks trying to fend it off. Now I'm going to stop here and say something. Because a lot of people ask, who were the men with sticks? Please realize that 60% of Russia's gross economy goes into defense. The translation to that is they build big guns and ugly, ugly weapons with 60% of their gross national income. For better or worse, for the last 15 years, the army of these United States has been decimated. Please hear me. Soon it will be as men with sticks against an angry bear. Because at this point in time, we're having to buy bullets from Taiwan because we've wasted our reserves in Iraq. Are you understanding me? 
The greatest superpower in the history of the world has been at war for less than two years and is forced to buy bullets. It ran out of ammunition for 150,000 soldiers in a place like Iraq that should have been over within two months. And this isn't man doing it, it's God. Every step of the way, you see the hand of God and you see the pieces moving into place and this should concern you and cause you to draw closer to God. Time the bear had grown so large that it simply crushed the men underfoot and continued to rampage. I was stunned by what I saw and asked the man standing beside me, what does this mean? At first they thought the great bear was dead, the man said. As it will begin to stir once again, they will consider it harmless. That phase has already passed. First, they thought Russia was no more. Then it began to breathe a little life in its economy. Oh, that's fine. They're, they're harmless. Suddenly, it will grow strong once more with purpose and violence. God will blind the eyes of those that continue to trample on the sacrifice of Christ's blood until the day the bear will strike swiftly. Hello. This was in 97. Talk about reading tomorrow's newspaper today. This day will catch them unprepared and it will be just as you saw. The man then said, tell my people the days are numbered and the sentence has been passed. If they will seek my face and walk in righteousness before me, I will open their eyes that they may see that danger approaches. Are you seeing it? God is opening the eyes of people. I'm getting calls on a daily basis. Oh, did you hear about this? It's like your grandpa said. It's like you said. It's already been foretold. And when it comes to pass, it will be too late. I get, oh, how do I know your grandpa you know, was, was a true prophet? Other than the fact that the man suffered more than any other living man that I know, and the fact that I knew him as my grandfather and traveled with him for 10 years and saw his life as a Christian, the only other way you will know that everything he said was true is when this nation is bombed and judged. Then it will be too late. I don't want, oh, Dudelman was right. We're now a carcass. That's not what I want. <laughs> Repent so that it doesn't happen. I will take the mockery and the rebuke. Just repent. Please, repent. Only in righteousness will they find safety. Suddenly, I was once again by myself in my room, on my knees, with sweat covering my face. The end. We're seeing the danger approach. Even our beloved government is seeing it, and they just don't want to scare you. You know, a lot of us have, have mean things to say about the current government and the past government. If you knew half the stuff they know and if you knew half the dangers that they know that we're susceptible to. Because they realize that this bastion of freedom and these open borders have caused us to come to the place where we're in where we don't know who our neighbor is. And we don't know if he believes that 70 virgins will meet him upstairs. This is the nation that we're living in. Our, our, our great, grandest, open arm freedom is going to be our own downfall. The book doesn't lie. Jeremiah 51. Read it, read it, read it, read it again and again, and you'll realize that the picture will come into focus, that, that you'll get on your knees and say, God, where am I supposed to go? And God will say, you're not supposed to go anywhere, because I'll protect you exactly where you are. Because that's the power of our God. I will fill you with men as with locusts. From every corner of the earth will cry out against you. The time is here. I pray we slumber no longer. So I'm going to read you the first dream I had after my grandfather passed. And it was actually a dream with my grandfather in it. And it was on May 5th of 2004. And it begins, and it says it was 
six years since my grandfather had gone to be with the Lord. And I spent the day with my little brother, Daniel, the only other member of the family currently in the U.S. And we kept the memory of our, of our grandfather alive by remembering. We remembered him not as Reverend Dudeman or the Romanian man who had dreams, but as what he was to us, Grandpa. Because a lot of people, you know, they get very excited. Oh, you worked with the major. He was my grandpa. Everybody here had a grandpa, and they know what grandpa was. I didn't see him in the light of the man with the message. I saw him in the light of the guy who used to take cornbread and, and goat cheese and, and, and make little bears out of it. That's the light I saw him, and he was grandpa to me. The man who bounced us on his knee while we were still toddlers, the man who became our instant hero when we stood in the middle of a river on a hot summer's day and proceeded to catch fish with his bare hands. It was a good time of bonding for us as brothers, and we both came away with the conclusion that even after all this time, we still missed him a great deal. That night after prayer, I went to bed and I had a dream. I dreamt I was on a very high ridge with a great valley spanning out beneath me. The sky was calm, the night was calm, the moon and stars were shining brightly in the sky. And as I looked around trying to get my bearings, I was stunned to see my grandfather standing next to me. He looked young, and he looked vibrant, his hands in his pockets, and a smile on his face. Interesting times ahead, my boy, interesting times ahead, he said. For a minute, I was so shocked I couldn't say anything, and finally I blurted out, the only thing that came to mind, they've been interesting ever since you left. Trial after trial, hardship after hardship. Now you know how Jesus felt when he walked the earth, he answered. Always doing good, always in the Father's will, yet always mocked and rejected, always misunderstood and despised. Besides, it was all a test anyway. A test of what, I asked. For you personally, God wanted to see if you would stay true to your calling, even when all seemed lost. He was preparing you and purging you, refining you for the time when he will use you and speak to you as he spoke to me. Before I could say anything, he lifted his hand to stop me. His fingers were no longer crooked from his arthritis. They were straight and normal. I know what you're going to say, my boy. It's not what you want. It's not what you asked for, but you should know by now it's the task that you were chosen for. In this, you have no choice. I will share one more dream, maybe two, with you, because I promised Stan I would. Again, I don't do it because I enjoy it. I do it because I, I want to keep my promise to my friend. And this is a dream that I had about the church. And it was one of the most disturbing dreams I've ever had. Because many of us still think that the house of God is a house of the living. Many of us still think that what many consider the body of Christ, especially in this nation, is active. And the truth is so far removed from that, it scares me to share this with you. It had been the most trying two weeks of my life. While still in Romania, I woke up one morning to the most excruciating pain I'd ever felt. All my joints ached, my feet were swollen, and I could barely move. The weather had changed, and it seems that as my grandfather, I am prone to arthritis. And I am, and it hurts. But it's nothing compared to what he went through, so I'm expecting worse. On my way back to the States on September 9th, while I was awaiting a connection in London Heathrow Airport, my laptop was stolen. I had two manuscripts for two books on there, plus a whole lot of thoughts that I will never get back. Again, God only knows why. We don't ask. That's the beauty of being a servant. You're not allowed to ask why. You just do because God tells you to do. Finally, having arrived in the U.S. while driving from the airport, Gino filled me in on what had been happening in the States. He told me of the openly gay bishop that had been ordained by the Episcopalian Church, and then of the battle over the Ten Commandments in Alabama, and by the time we reached Watertown, I was disheartened. It had been a long two days, and all I wanted to do was take a shower and get some sleep. 
I had been asleep less than half an hour when I had a dream. I was in a hospital room. It was very clean and freshly painted. And in the room there was a bed with a woman in it. I approached the bed, took a closer look at the woman, and she was dressed in a gray robe and she had a ring on every finger of her hand. From time to time she would raise her hand and look at her fingers and smile. For some reason that smile was the saddest thing I've ever seen. It was crooked and it exhibited no real joy. As I looked at her, the sadness in my heart grew to such intensity that I woke up. Even awake, I could still feel the sadness, and as much as I tried, I couldn't get back to sleep. For six days in a row, I had the same exact dream. I would see the woman lying in bed, I would be overwhelmed by sadness, then I would wake up. I was so frustrated, not knowing what this meant, that on the seventh day, I decided to fast. That night, as I went to sleep, the dream started again, the same as before. I looked at the woman, she smiled, the sadness overwhelmed me, but I didn't wake up. The door to the room opened and a man dressed in a white smock walked in holding a clipboard. Before he could say anything, I began asking a barrage of questions. Who are you? Why am I here? Who is she? Why have I been dreaming this for almost an entire week? Because you waited almost a week to fast, he said. <laughs> Object lesson, lesson learned. He must have noticed the stunned expression on my face because his eyebrows arched upward. I am a friend, he continued. I was sent with a message, be at peace, servant. All will be revealed in due time. How do I know you're a friend, I asked, because Jesus is Lord, he answered. Then he smiled and I recognized him. I had seen that smile before. Suddenly, I was eight years old again, sleeping in the top bunk of a bed I shared with my grandparents on a cold winter night in Romania. I will remember that night for as long as I live. I had woken up to go to the restroom, but before I could get out of bed, I heard talking below me. My grandfather was talking to someone, and I went to peer over the edge to see who it was and found myself face to face with the same man. He'd smiled at me then, and I'd instantly gone back to sleep. I know you, don't I? Yes, we've met once before, but I see you often, he answered. Why am I here, I asked. Because you murmur. Because you have said in your heart that you are on a fool's quest. Because you think no one hears, that the message is falling on deaf ears. And if you think I don't get discouraged, you don't know me. <laughs> Look, before 9-11, I was preaching a message of judgment to the only superpower left in the world who had never been attacked on its own soil. I was preaching a message that this nation is vulnerable. I was relaying something that my grandfather saw in 1984 telling people that judgment was coming, telling people that if they didn't repent before September 11th, 2001, the message that we were bringing to the people of this nation was inconceivable. Some people dismissed it outright. Some of them, well, you know, I have to believe some of it because your grandpa had such, such a powerful anointing and he had such a, you know, life with God. Don't believe something just because a man says it. Believe it because it's in here as well. This is what I have a hard time with when I hear men say, you know, I, I had a word from God. Look, every word from God must first of all not contradict this, first of all. And second of all, every prophecy and every dream and every vision must have one thing in common. Point the way to Jesus. Point the way to righteousness. Point the way to salvation. Because that is the purpose, to warn and to stir people to repentance. After September 11th, 2001, we started getting calls from people. They wanted me to come speak in their church because they realized we weren't as all-powerful as we thought. Again, she has been in this condition of spiritual paralysis for so long, she believes this is her natural state. If she knew the power she had access to, 
If only she knew obedience. Oh, praise God. The wolves have gathered unhindered. And they will strike at her with violence. What will she do if she is unable to defend herself? What will become of the church? That is the question that should burn in our hearts. What will become of the church? Because we see that the wolves have gathered. I had this three years ago. Now we're still seeing the wolves bare their teeth. They are ready to shred the house of God without a second thought. You're seeing it. And ten years ago, not one of you would have said, Ah, oh, this is going to happen. It can't happen in America. I've had discussions on this subject ten years ago with people. That'll never happen in America, brother. You're, you're confused. They'll never persecute the church here. This is a Christian nation, don't you know? But don't lie. If I stand on the word of God... Every word I speak will be justified sooner or later. The book does not lie. What we thought could never happen is happening in this country right before our very eyes. And worse will come. Hear me. Worse will come. It will become a crime to utter the name of Jesus Christ. Not only on the street, but in the church. What will you do then? That's the question. We're comfortable now. We're feeling good. The heat's up. It's good being in the house of God when everything is well. But what will you do when it will be a crime to mention the name of Jesus? Will you still come together? Will you still cry out to your master, knowing that the police is waiting at the door? The days are coming. What you thought couldn't happen ten years ago is happening today. What you think can't happen tomorrow will happen. Be faithful, for faithfulness is rewarded. Why do you say in your heart that God should make it easier? Would you rather that pride find its way into your heart when the Father endows you with the gifts He promised? Keep humility as your constant companion, for the humble receive an abundance of grace. Amen? If only one soul is spared from the eternal flame, if just one soul is reached and brought to salvation, it is worth a lifetime of sacrifice. And that is the reality I've come to realize as most important of all for any man that stands at a pulpit. If one comes... If one is reached, if one repents, it's worth a lifetime of sacrifice. It's worth it for the kingdom of God. The man walked to the bed, looked down at the woman, smiled a sad smile and walked out. As soon as he was out of the room and I was alone with her, the sadness began to invade my heart and I woke up. And it was one of the most vivid dreams I've ever had. I don't welcome dreams. Every time I see a messenger, every time I see an angel of God, it's stunning to me. It's not as some ministers would have you believe that they sat on Jesus' lap and braided his hair and played dodgeball with him. Because an angel comes in the power and authority of God. Always. Always. An angel comes in the power and authority of God. And there's power in the name of God. And there's power in the name of Jesus. And when they come in this power, you, you die inside, basically. It's a fearful thing to behold the power of God. And so, if I had a choice in the matter, I would pray God pick anybody else. I'm happy being a preacher. I don't need to have dreams. But sometimes God chooses the foolish things to confound the wise. What can I say? Now this dream I had recently, it was in October of 2004. And it was something that I fought over sharing for a very long time. Because to anyone with any discernment, it's disturbing. To stand 
called me and he says, wow, yeah, that's a powerful dream. Yes, it was. And with each passing day, the dreams and the visions will continue to get more powerful because God is speaking with greater urgency. Every servant of God that, that is tuned into the sermon will begin to feel that the day is drawing closer and closer. And the dream begins. Upon my return to the United States in late August, I had a very vivid and troubling dream. I shared it with the staff here in Wisconsin and with a few other brothers, but continued to pray and seek direction from God as to whether or not I should include it in the newsletter. At the staff surging and feeling a release from the Lord, I have included the stream in this issue of the newsletter. I dreamt I was walking through a sparsely wooded forest, and suddenly my attention was drawn to an eagle flying high above the tree line. It was a beautiful sight to behold as the eagle rode the thermals flying in slow, lazy arcs across the blue sky. I began to quicken my pace and keep up with the eagle's flight, all the while keeping an eye on it. Noticing that it was slowly descending towards the earth, I followed it for a long time at its descent, not being sudden, but very gradual. Finally, I came upon a small clearing where there were no trees, just some bushes, on the edge, on the edges of the green grass. The eagle landed in the clearing and began to look around, not seeming to notice me. As I began to wonder what relevance this had, a man dressed in white, hands clasped in front of him, appeared beside me and said, Be patient. In due time, you will see the purpose. I was silent as I watched the eagle and was beginning to grow somewhat impatient when suddenly it seemed out of nowhere a brown snake lunged at the eagle and bit down on its left wing. The snake's strike was very quick and very precise. The eagle reacted without delay, clawing and pecking at the snake, cutting deep wounds in its underbelly trying to defend itself and ward off the serpent. Just as it seemed, the eagle was winning the battle and the serpent was retreating. An other serpent approached, red and black diagonal stripes covering its body, and without hesitation struck out at the eagle's right wing, biting down and refusing to release. After a momentary tug of war, the serpent tore off flesh and feathers, leaving a large wound on the eagle's right wing. The second bite was much worse than the first, and for an instant, the eagle was stunned. Then a serpent much larger than the previous two, made up of many colors, slithered towards the eagle, opened its jaws, and lunged, taking the whole of the eagle's head in its mouth before biting down. The serpent's retreat, and the man who had been standing beside me walked to the eagle, knelt down, picked it up, and held it in his cupped hands. The look of grief on his face was beyond any I have ever seen in my life. Just seeing the look on the man's face broke your heart. The man continued to look down at the eagle and with a pained voice said, The true tragedy is that at any moment it could have sought the safety of the above. It could have soared towards the heavens and would have found its protection. This has been revealed to you that you may know. The first bite has been... The second is yet to come, and the third will be its destruction. I watched for a long time as the man held the eagle in the palms of his hands, the pained expression never leaving his features. I was too stunned to speak or ask any questions. What I had seen having seemed so real. The dream followed me into my waking hours as well, and each time I closed my eyes, I saw the entire scene play before my eyes. And that was the end of the dream. The thing that I have to point out is that this nation's descent wasn't a sudden one. Once we were a godly nation, once we were not ashamed to say the name Jesus, once we allowed our children to pray in schools, once we were not embarrassed of saying that the Ten Commandments were the foundation of our logistics and of our legal system. Once we said that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is our God as well. 
Our descent wasn't sudden by any means. Because there's nothing sudden about how the enemy works. He's got time. And he's very subtle. And ever so quickly this nation began to turn from its God. God knew this beforehand. It's been prophesied. It's in the book. 2,000, 2,600 years ago, this nation was mentioned in the Word of God as a nation whom God considered as a cup in His hands. But a nation who now needed healing. And the prophet laments and he says, We would have healed her. We would have healed her. But she is not healed. God sent messengers, some simple men, some educated men from corners of the earth, from nations I can't even name. Simple message, repent. See, God's messages are never complicated. What God has to tell you doesn't take hours and hours. What God has to tell you is simple, repent. Repent. Some were heard, many were not. Of those that were heard, most were mocked. Yet they did their duty because it was God that asked them to do it. As I was listening, I just have to say that, you know, it makes my heart leap to hear some of the things that he's saying because my call in life is to get out that warning message. I am a watchman on the wall. That's what God has called me to be. And I want to give you some encouraging words here. I want to let you know what God told me. Uh, unlike Michael, I do seek after the dreams. Uh, I reverence the dreams. And when I get a dream from God, I pray it through, pray it through until I get an answer or until it just looks like He's just not going to answer me. But I mean, I really pray it through. I really seek after God. And I think we all have to. And I know some people might be saying, well, I just don't believe in dreams. Well, you don't believe in dreams because you don't read the book, and because you don't have a close enough relationship for God to be speaking to you, because we are in the last days. Amen? Okay? Joel 2.28 says, in the last days, he's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. Your old men are going to dream dreams. Your young men are going to see visions. Amen? That's why I know I'm an old man, because I'm getting dreams. <laughs> anyway, I, before I went to bed one night, I prayed and I, I said, Lord, I, I want to know. I said, you know, you told us that America has to repent. What, what would America have to do to repent? I mean, what is repentance? I mean, you know, like would uh, President Bush have to somehow uh, get a law passed that the Bible has to be read in the schools for one hour every day? I mean, would we have to do away with abortion? Would we have to close down Hollywood? I mean, exactly what, what America have to do. And in the dream, which I, I won't go into explaining, but essentially what the dream said is that America would have to be, reach a point to where they no longer needed the prophets. They no longer needed ministries like the Prophecy Club. And I began to pray about it more and more, and I believe this is what he was really saying. You see, right now in the American church, the prophets, the apostles and the prophets have been kicked out. How many times do you go in to a church and you hear anyone referred to as an apostle or a prophet? Just almost not non-existent. And what God began to speak to me is this. In 1954, God raised up a man by the name of Demos Shakarian. And he had him go out to hotels. And he invited people from all denominations, all walks of life, to go to a hotel where they could get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God used Demo Shakirian to go around the gatekeeping pastors to bring the baptism of the Holy Spirit to his people. Right now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is fairly common among Christians. Amen? In 1993, God raised up a man by the name of Stan Johnson to start an organization that he called the Prophecy Club where we'd go out to hotels and invite people from all denominations to come in and to hear prophetic warning messages. 
so that they could go around the gatekeeping pastors to get that warning out. And what God was speaking in that dream is, for America to repent, they would have to invite the prophets back into the church and receive and hear the prophetic warning to the point to where it's no longer needed. See, the prophecy club should not have to exist. There should be no need for the prophecy club because the pulpits in America should be alive with the prophetic warning message. They should be listening to the apostles and the prophets. But because they won't do that, God has to go around the gatekeeping pastors. You see, and that's another dream God gave me too, called Tiger Shark. And he, what the dream essentially said is the church won't fight anymore. The church doesn't fight for righteousness. The church doesn't fight for the name of God. It doesn't fight for the name of Jesus. When is the last time you got on a Hertz bus going to uh, go to your car and you turned to the whole group and said, can we talk about Jesus? When was the last time you were in a chiropractor's office and there was about 15 people in there and you turned to everyone and said, by the way, is everyone saved? Does everyone know Jesus in here? You know, that used to be common in America. But, oh, <laughs> did you get that message? We're not supposed to talk about Jesus in public. <sighs> You've broken one of the great taboos in America. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't get that message. I talk about Jesus just about every place I go. Leslie says, you offend people. I'm sorry, but the name of Jesus does offend people. So, yes, I do offend people. But there's going to come a time when God is good, just like you were just saying, when God is going to nudge their heart and say, you remember in that chiropractor's office when that man started talking to you? You remember in that Hertz bus when that man started talking to you about Jesus? I get on a Hertz bus. Oh, I love it when it's just me and the driver because he can't get away. <laughs> you have Jesus in your heart? Oh, yes, I do. Good. You just dodged the bullet. <laughs> But uh, what I'm saying is America has to receive the prophetic warning. So what God began to show me in this dream is, for America to repent, what we would have to see in the, in the church, what we should see is prophetic warning messages behind the pulpit on a fairly regular basis. And the more America falls into sin, the more the pulpits ought to be lighting up with righteousness. Lighting up with a prophetic warning. We ought to be having the prophets. Here's what it ought to look like. We ought to be getting phone calls for people, for our guest speakers, pastors calling and saying, hey, can you give me this guy's number? Can you give me that? Can you come? Can you come and do me a prophecy conference? And you know what? In the last three years, I've had two churches, two, invite me in for a prophecy conference. It ought to be that I am booked up two or three years in advance. It ought to be that I'm having to refer them to our speakers. We should be getting pastors calling and saying, Oh, brother, don't go out the hotel. Don't go pay that hotel anything. I want that prophetic warning in my church. Please, bring your whole prophecy meeting in. Let your, I'll open my church. We won't charge you anything. We'll even take an offering and I'll command my people to attend. We need what you have. So, do I think America is going to repent right now? I'd have to say, no. I, but I'm still going to try. Just like I said to Michael right back at the table, I said, I'm, still, I'm not giving up. I'm still going to try until the bomb explodes. I'm going to do my best to stop the judgment that's coming, or at least to delay it. We know we delayed it once, but I'm going to do my best to try to stop it. Because I believe until judgment actually falls... If America will repent, it can be delayed some more, and who knows? I mean, I would love to get to heaven, to be able to point to Revelation 18 and say, why didn't it come to pass? And I'd love to hear, I don't think it'll happen, but I'd love to hear God say, because America repented. I don't think we will. Jeremiah 51 verse 9 says, I think it's 50, 51 or 50. Verse 9 says, we would have healed Babylon, but she would not be healed. In other words, he already knows that America isn't going to repent. But, here's the good news. In the trouble ahead, there's going to be a lot of people saved. Spoke to me another dream about that. He said, it's going to be like a candy store. 
For those people that love winning souls, the trouble ahead is going to be like a candy store. He said, what you're going to see is five to one return. In other words, in terms of we're going to win five more times the people to Jesus in the trouble ahead than what we're bringing into the kingdom right now. See, right now, nobody wants to listen to Jesus. Now, nobody wants to hear sermons about that. Nobody wants to hear prophecy. Nobody wants to go to church. Nobody needs God. That's what they think. But you wait till some of the trouble hits. See, just like the day after 9-11, what happened to the churches? They were filled up for a week or two. Well, let me just tell you, brothers, sisters, if I heard God right, it's only going to get worse because I believe that the tsunami was the breaking of the water. The woman is now in travail, in labor, and that is the least of the pains. The pains now get increasingly harder, right ladies? And increasingly close together until finally the baby is born. In other words, finally Jesus returns. And in that trouble, there's going to be a lot of people saved. Now, a lot of people have criticized me and said, well, you know, you don't, you don't ever pray the sinner's prayer for people on the radio. And I do that very seldom. I do that here at the meetings. But let me just say, I can lead somebody in a prayer. And I'm going to do that in just a minute. But I do agree with Michael. You've got to work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. Now, what, the part that we can't help you with a group is Matthew 10.32 and 10.33 says, Whosoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. Whosoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father.